and Erev Tov to, uh, to David Halpern and to Gershon Gorenberg. Uh, on behalf of the Union for Reform Judaism and Israel Policy Forum, I just want to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. I'm Rabbi Josh Weinberg, and I serve as the Vice President for Israel and Reform Zionism for the URJ. And I'm very thankful uh, for this webinar series that we've been doing uh, in partnership with Israel Policy Forum, who we've worked for worked together with uh, many times in the past, and I greatly appreciate the partnership in bringing high-level content and intellectual complexities to the question of the state of two states and what has to happen for there to be a two-state outcome, two states for two people, uh, and what that might look like. And we've been exploring several different issues um, including what's going on in the Palestinian street, the issue of normalization as a result of the Abraham Accords, uh, most recently um, geopolitical issues, United States politics, all of that we've examined. Um, and this was meant to be the last uh, session in our five part series. We had to reschedule a session looking at Israeli and Palestinian civil society uh, questions. That is going to be now on January 12th uh, so mark your calendars, and uh, we hope that you can all join us. Today, we are going to focus on the questions of settlements, and specifically, what are we talking about when we talk about uh, settlements? That means Jewish settlement over the Green Line or over uh, in the area that was conquered by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. With us to do that are two leading experts in the field, of course, uh, David Halpern, who many of you know well already, is, of course, the CEO of Israel Policy Forum uh, and a good partner based uh, here in the United States in New York. Um, and uh, one of my favorite teachers and authors and journalists is Gershom Gorenberg coming to us from Jerusalem. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, Gershom's articles, whether in the Jerusalem Report Magazine, the New York Times, the Atlantic, American Prospect, so many places, uh, as well as his many, many books. The most recent uh, is War of Shadows, Codebreaker Spies, and the Secret Struggle to Drive the Nazis from the Middle East. Uh, but for this discussion, um, Gershom literally wrote the book on the big question here, and that is the book called The Accidental Empire, Israel and the Birth of the Settlements from 1967 to 1977. Uh, and that is really the area that we are going to, uh, to focus on. I will just say on a personal note that uh, I have been learning from Gershom since my first job out of college, where I was a, an intern and an editorial assistant at the Jerusalem Report magazine. Uh, where Gershom taught me uh, so many things about Israeli society, democracy, and uh, how to write a news article. And so uh, I'm grateful to, to be able to continue learning today. I just want to mention that this session will be recorded uh, and to invite you to place all questions in the Q&A section, and we will try to get to as many as we can, and we'll have time at the end as well uh, to do that. So without further ado, uh, David, I'd love to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Josh, um, for the introduction and for the, the partnership in, in this important series and to everyone uh, for joining us today. It is an honor to present uh, with Gershom, uh, who, as Josh said, literally wrote the book on, on, on these subjects. So uh, um, I, I'm excited to, to dig in. I'm going to be sharing uh, my screen for the entirety of this presentation. Uh, this is a uh, not the kind of webinar that's easy to understand just in the background. Uh, it really will require you focusing on the screen and I'll, um, uh, I'll make sure to check in on orientation in case there's questions as we go along. And you can, uh, in addition to our Q&A session, put your questions in the chat and, and we'll, we'll have Josh flag, the, uh, flag them for us. Um, and what, what I think uh, we would like to do today is first have a, a very quick overview of where, what, uh, where, and who are the settlers today before really doing a, a, a deep dive into the issues that have been in the news in the recent weeks and months and are likely to be in the news uh, in the upcoming uh, weeks and months. And, and those are areas particularly uh, in and around uh, Jerusalem. But before we do, we're gonna do a quick overview on, on who, uh, where and who are, are the settlers. And I'm gonna begin by sharing, uh, by sharing my screen. I want to 
Before we jump into our drone photography, I wanna just do a, a little visual exercise on who and where are the settlements, just to recognize and acknowledge the bias of visuals. Um, here we have a, a, a Google map of the West Bank today, and you can see the area of these settlements, roughly 130 settlements in all, with about 450,000 people uh, living in them, uh, not including the area of Jerusalem here in purple, which we'll get to in just a moment, uh, but I want to just note uh, here when we have just the built up area uh, of the settlements, um, you can see that just that built up area appearing uh, quite small. But when we think about what it would take to incorporate those settlements into Israel, one of the good, uh, I think, useful maps to share is actually the map presented by President Trump just a, a year or so ago which effectively is an effort to incorporate all of those settlements uh, into, into Israel. And we can see um, what that kind of map looks like and the various characterizations of where those settlements today are located, whether in the Jordan Valley serving as a territorial buffer along the mountain ridge at the heart of the West Bank in areas in many cases surrounding uh, major Palestinian population centers of course, close to the Green Line in the Tel Aviv area, and most notably in the surroundings of the Jerusalem area, what we might call the Greater Jerusalem Triangle, anchored by the three largest settlements in the West Bank today, Modi'in elite here, Beitar elite to the south, and of course, Ma'ale Adumim, uh, just east of Jerusalem. Um, I'm going to turn to Gershom to get his thoughts on, on a broad overview, but I think the other thing to keep in mind uh, about settlements is that not all settler motivations, uh, the motivations of settlers are, are not the same. Uh, we have uh, early labor Zionists who uh, sought to settle in the Jordan Valley with the encouragement of the labor government, a small number of settlers today. We have the national religious Gush Emunim followers of the national religious movement dominating uh, the settlements on, along the center of the West Bank and the mountain ridge. The ultra-Orthodox settlements, most notably the Modi'in elite and Beitar elite that I just mentioned as part of that greater Jerusalem triangle, and what we might call the cost of living settlers living in the Tel Aviv environs who are seeking uh, a, a cheaper uh, place to live. Gershom, I'm curious, as we just do a very quick overview what are some of the themes that you uh, uh, find to be most critically important as we begin to dig into this subject? Okay, um, first of all, I just wanna to add to something you said about the different kinds of settlers. The, the people who you most often see in the news, both because that's the stereotype and, and there's a sort of reflexive tendency to go back to them and also frankly, because they make the most noise are the ideological settlers uh, along the mountain ridge and specifically the most radical of them. But the best, very, very rough estimates are that um, people motivated, or people living in settlements that were set up on a, a religious nationalist basis are maybe a third of the settlers. Uh, another third are ultra-Orthodox, basically living almost all in those two communities that you mentioned, Beitar elite and Modi'in elite. And another third being the, you know, um, a living standard settlers, which also includes Malay Dumi. Now, those are very, very rough categories because my experience is that you can go into a religious settlement along the mountain ridge and meet somebody who says, we moved here for a larger house. Um, or you can meet somebody in Malay Dumi who's very ideologically motivated. But the point of mentioning this is that you need to separate yourself just from the, from the stereotypical picture of that's that's continually been broadcast since the 70s, at least, of the settler being a, a guy with a large kippah and a woman in a lar long skirt, or more recently, um, hilltop youth with payout or whatever. It's a much more varied uh, uh, group than that. Um, I also want to mention something about this map that you showed us, and this is a little bit of history. The original first map drawn up after 67 that had a great influence on policy was the um, what's known as the alone plan map. Yigal Alone, uh, then a minister in, in the labor government, came up with this plan 
literally he began thinking of it before the guns fell silent in, in June 1967 and turned in his first proposal um, in, to the government in July of 1967 it was never officially adopted but had a big influence, particularly in the first years of settlement and included such things as that strip that you see along uh, the Jordan River and the, and the, and the, um, and the Dead Sea Coast. And uh, what I wanna say about this is that Alone's deputy minister soon after the war was a man named Lova Eliab, who became very, very well known as one of the early advocates of negotiating with the Palestinians in a two-state outcome. And Eliav himself told me in an interview many years ago that he saw Alone's map and he said to him, Yigal, why do you want all those Danzigs? Referring to the pre-war little tendril of Poland that reached up to the city of Danzig on the coast and was completely, as it turned out, indefensible. And what he meant to say by that is, let's not create all these tendrils. And this Trump map is an extreme example of something that includes the maximum number of settlements and the minimum amount of security because of all those tendrils. Right. Uh, so Lova's comment from 1968 should still uh, be with us as, as we look at this. Do uh, you wanna to turn to the Jerusalem issues now? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I thought that particularly the, the second part of that alone map is that sort of buffering around the areas of Jerusalem, which continue to have uh, the legacy on the issues today. So I'm going to, to switch now just for a moment um, to the drone footage, which you all should be able to see here. Now, before I uh, really start showing things, I want to just make note of the small box on the right side of your screen. You'll see the red dot and the green cone. As we move in the landscape to the north, you'll see the green cone moves as well. We're, we're still seeing the, the, the Google map. Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, you I'm sorry. I, I hope there. you can see the, the, now we're the, on. the green cone on the right side. As I move the map, you should see the green cone moves as well, just so you orient, you can orient it yourself to the north, south, east, west. Of course, we are looking now directly to uh, the west, um, overlooking, of course, the old city uh, directly in front of us. And we can get a sense uh, of that period that Gershom was mentioning, the days after the 1967 Six Day War. And we can see the green line as it approaches Jerusalem. Uh, directly in front of us, the waistband of which is roughly four miles wide. Um, and the core of the goals of the initial development in and around Jerusalem, both uh, uh, consistent with the Alon plan, as Gershom just mentioned, was to effectively create a ring of settlements surrounding uh, uh, the, the area of the Green Line and surrounding the new municipal borders uh, of Jerusalem. And here I want to just get a sense of just how the boundaries change. After 67, we can see the new purple line of the Jerusalem municipal borders that is placed here, including a long finger heading to the north. Now, if we uh, I'm going to turn it to you just a moment, Gershom, but I want to just show one viewpoint from moving to the northwest of the city, just to orient ourselves in the map on the bottom of the screen. If you look, if we're now northwest of the city above the monument of, of, the, of uh, Nebi Samuel, and I'm sorry to give you all whiplash, I will orient ourselves in just a moment. We can once again see the green line and the Jerusalem municipal boundaries. Again, we have the narrow waistline of the green line as it approaches the old city here in the horizon. And we can see just how the new boundary of the city, just how significant it extends to the north. And if we go along this mountain ridge, again, if this is the old city in the historic area of Jerusalem, it extends dramatically uh, to the north. Uh, just to get a sense of just how dramatic is that extension. Now, I, I'm, I apologize for jumping around, Gershom, but I want to go back to where we began at Mount of Olives to just one uh, orient ourselves to the first issue we'll discuss today, which is E1, before we go back to that northern finger and discuss the issue of Atarot. And that is, if we look at the green line, as we saw in the Jerusalem municipal boundaries, we can look directly to the east, from this vantage point, 
And we can see that beyond that purple line is the West Bank. And of course, from this vantage point, we can see uh, the first settlement we'll be uh, discussing is in the area uh, of E1 is of course an extension of the area of Ma'ale Adumim. Uh, maybe I'll pause here before we get into the details of E1. To Gershom, I'm curious, any thoughts you have to share on the situation of, of Ma'ale Adumim and the, the issue of E1 before we dig into the details in the footage? Okay, so let me let me add a couple things to this. First of all, about that purple line. Yeah. The purple line, the borders of Jerusalem, uh, came out of perhaps the only thing close to the unanimous decision of the Israeli government immediately after the ceasefire, which was A, to annex East Jerusalem, but B, to annex a swath of land around Jerusalem. At that moment, there was a strong feeling that Israel might be forced to pull back immediately, in, similar to what had happened in 1956. And there was also a sense, however realistic or unrealistic, that if we just annex this area quickly, we will be able to keep that. And so the guidelines that were given for drawing up this map, which happened in a space of two weeks, very quickly, um, often missing details on the ground were to, um, a, first of all, to um, include strategic high ground, high points, um, to, expand the space that Jerusalem could grow in because it had been constricted within the Green Line, um, to take land while avoiding taking more air population than necessary. Also, to take back in places where Jews had lived before 1948 and had um, been forced to abandon them during the 1948 War of Independence, which included two Moshevim, two farming communities north of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Ramallah, which were called Atarot and Neveh Yaakov, which were in fact closer to Ramallah than to downtown Jerusalem. And there was a desire to give Jerusalem an airport. And north of Jerusalem, there was an airport at what was called Kalandia, which uh, Israel renamed Atarot. Kalandia had been a British airfield, and then it had become the largest airport in Jordan between 48 and 67. And the hope was that Jerusalem would have its own, air, its own airport. So these lines were, were drawn very quickly. And at first, in that first literally few days, people thought those might be the borders. Um, and then um, as things settled down and more plans started being developed, the, the whole idea of settling beyond that developed. Now, I'm not gonna go into the whole history of development, of, of settlement development, but I wanna skip forward past the Yom Kippur War of 1973. After six years of really ignoring Middle East diplomacy, the United States jumps in and tries to create disengagement agreements, Kissinger's disengagement agreements between Israel and the surrounding Arab states. And there was a hope to have an agreement like that with Jordan. And even one of the ideas was Israel would give up Jericho first. So the settlement czar in the Israeli government, a name, man named Yisrael Galili, immediately wanted to surround Jerusalem with settlements so that Jerusalem would be, um, as it were, protected by this ring of settlements from any possibility that the border would be too close to it. And in particular, he came up with this idea of building a settlement out in the desert to the east of Jerusalem at this place called Male Um and the idea was to separate Jerusalem from Jericho, to create like a big roadblock there so that if Israel gave up Jericho, the border wouldn't get close to Jerusalem, that Israel would be able to hold on to Jerusalem. Note what's going on here. There's a pattern of first we built neighborhoods to ring the old city and to ring pre-1967 uh, pre Jerusalem within the city lines. And then there's this effort to build settlements to protect those neighborhoods. Layers and layers of, of hoping to move the border out and to protect what you had. Um, and the first settlers moved into Mali Dumim in 1975. And when the Likud took power in 1977, it changed the nature of what had been planned as a small settlement to become a giant bedroom community whose draw was simply 
cheap housing. Um, now, if you look at the map, you'll say to yourself, wait a minute, so you stick the settlement out there, it's a splotch in the desert. Why does that prevent, why does that create a roadblock between Jordan, Jericho and Jerusalem? You could go around it. And that's where E1 comes in because E1 is supposed to connect Male Dumim with Jerusalem and essentially cut off the possibilities of going around. David, do you have a map showing us where, where E1 yes. is and, and no, how, that, how that connects up? Yes, I wanted to almost in real time as you were describing this, I could show, uh, you know, I've just moved us back really right next to Male Dumim, looking back to Jerusalem, and we can look back towards the Jerusalem municipal boundary now. Uh, this is the eastern boundary of the annexed area of East Jerusalem. And exactly to your point of what you're just saying, Gershom, you can see that major access road connecting Jerusalem with the Jordan Valley on the way uh, to, the, to the Jericho region, Route 1. And we can see from this vantage point how Male Adumim is, um, sorry, is strategically situated on directly east of the city and really in a way that dominates that route one, uh, that, that transportation infrastructure and that approach to Jerusalem, to your point, Gershom, about disconnecting Jericho from, uh, this is really that the road to Jericho, so to speak, and how Malaya Dumim sits above it. And of course, E1 is situated essentially an expansion of Malaya Dumim simply on the other side of the road. Um, it's, 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 it, what it's supposed to do, what the plan is, is that it's supposed to close in the area between Jerusalem and Mali Dumim and create a salient, a, 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 as it were, a peninsula of, of built up area all the way out into the, into the um, West Bank. By the way, it does another thing if it is in fact built. Um, this plan, I should note, has been around since 1999 and up to now has been consistently put off because of diplomatic pressure, particularly from the United States. Um, but it is once again back on the planning boards as, as a possibility. Another thing that it does is it virtually encircles the Palestinian town of Abu Dis, which is just of east of Jerusalem, and which was once proposed as being part of as an extended Jerusalem during the Oslo process, it was proposed that that would be the seat of the Palestinian government. That would be uh, included in Jerusalem. And in that way, the Palestinian government would be in Abu Dis. In fact, they built a building for the Palestinian parliament in Abu Dis. And the placement is incredibly precise. It's meant to be the exact same distance from the Temple Mount, from Haram Sharif to the east as the Knesset building is to the west to create this balance. But this plan, would create a wedge of Israeli um, of an Israeli neighborhood between Abu Dis and Ramallah. So the idea here is to break up the contiguity of the West Bank um, and to prevent conti uh, continuity between Ramallah and the Southern West Bank and, and Abu Dis. Now, one of the reasons that that's really important is that you very, very often hear in reporting from Israel and in Israeli discourse, this idea of the so-called settlement blocks. And the settlement blocks are the largest settlements which are often described as being close to the, to, the, uh, <clears throat> to the green line. And often in even in um, left of center Israeli discussion, there's this, this assumption just by repetition is built up that obviously when we make a peace agreement, if we reach a two-state agreement, the settlement blocks will stay in Israeli hands. And the idea that developed is that Israel will trade land from free 67 Israel so that it's um, a one-for-one -one exchange and will keep the settlement blocks. The thing is to borrow a phrase from Levi Eshkol who was prime minister in 1967, making that assumption about negotiations, he said is like playing chess with ourselves. Right? We've assumed what the other side's negotiating position is. There's no reason to think that you can really negotiate an agreement based on keeping that whole wedge from Jerusalem out through E1 to Mali Dumim. It cuts the West Bank in half. Um, one way to solve that problem might be those tendrils that you saw in the, um, 
in uh, the Trump map, but that creates an incredibly complicated map, extremely long borders for Israel. So when you talk about building new houses in the blocks, you're talking about the same problem as building new houses in any settlement. It's not that that necessarily prevents a two-state outcome. I don't believe that that's the case at all. What it does do is raise the potential economic and social cost for Israel of such an agreement. Because every additional house, every additional housing unit, every additional family there is one <clears throat> that might have to be evacuated, or as I like to say, might have to make Aliyah to the state of Israel after such an agreement. And that's a cost for Israel. You're, you're, um, you're doing the opposite of investing in your future. You're creating costs for your future. You're borrowing from your future by doing that. Um, yeah. I'll just add that what we can see from the imagery here is the what has been built up in E1 since it's been frozen. Um, you can see the landscape of the, the infrastructure uh, below us that has already been set up ready for homes essentially to be built. There are light posts here. You can see the road is well maintained and you can effectively see the initial plans. Now this development that you can see below us was done during the time of Ariel Sharon as prime minister and has been frozen like this ever since amidst uh, significant international pressure uh, traditionally from the United States and the European uh, Union. As Gershom said, there have been very, there are a number of stages to advanced building in this area. Uh, even more so than in Jerusalem, because of course this area is not annexed and is uh, not in the city of Jerusalem. This is the West Bank, um, but there are a number of stages. I think we are more than 50% through those stages uh, to seeing actual building taking place here, but it remains uh, an area that has significant international opposition. And of course the Biden administration as well uh, is certainly taking note of the area of E1 amidst uh, further uh, efforts to advance plans. I just want to make note that today the only thing that is built on E1 uh, here that you can see is the police headquarters of the Judea and Samaria district uh, for Israel's uh, police. The police station sits on the top of E1, uh, which otherwise has remained as you see it uh, here, um, for the past, uh, gosh, now 15, 16 years or more uh, that it has been in that position. Let me, let me add two things to that. First of all, the international pressure has made a huge difference. Second of all, I want to go back to a conversation that I had with the late Hal Sanders, who was the head of the Middle East desk in the National Security Council under Johnson, and then Under Secretary of State for the Middle East under uh, Nixon and Ford. And I asked him, why didn't you guys comment, make more of a fuss about the first Israeli settlements? And he said to me, well, you have to remember we had a problem elsewhere on the globe, which was very polite diplomatic speak for the fact that we were so focused on Vietnam that we just like, we weren't paying attention. And um, as another uh, strategic expert once said to me, incredibly important sentence in diplomacy and politics, attention is also a limited resource. So we have two factors here. One is that American diplomatic pressure makes a huge difference. And two is America can be distracted and Europe can be distracted. And therefore, the degree of political awareness and pressure from within the United States uh, arousing a current administration to respond to what's going on here has an effect on the landscape and, and on the potential for continuing peace efforts in the future. It may seem like the two things are very, very far apart, but actually keeping your administration aware of what's going on here and actively involved is what keeps this, um, this uh, very damaging settlement from, uh, from going forward. And that, by the way, is the great to What? Can I just ask you a quick, you know, if you mentioned that, you know, attention and, and what, what were the early questions um, from LBJ to Eshkol like that? And how did that play out during the Obama administration with Netanyahu kind of 
you know, using Obama to keep his right flank in chain in check. Can you say say a few words about that? Well, really, under if you if you look at American accounts of, of Middle East uh, diplomacy negotiations, the best example is Kissinger's memoirs. It's as if the settlement suddenly appeared in 1974. After the 73 war, when, when the United States starts getting involved in diplomatic efforts and says, oh, gee, there's this problem of settlements. Um, there were diplomatic reports from here. I've read those reports, those declassified reports from the Jerusalem Council and the, and the embassy in Tel Aviv about settlements. But they didn't really register in American policy in a serious way until the diplomatic process started in 74. Um, the Washington tended to take statements made in negotiating rooms and between ambassadors more seriously than what's in Israel called facts on the ground, building out in, in the territory. Uh, the Obama administration to leap forward did put considerable pressure on, uh, on Netanyahu. It obviously did not stop settlement growth, but this is not a black and white picture, an on off picture, as we can see, when we're looking at something like E1, it did make a difference. It did restrict the growth of settlement in, in, a, in a dangerous area. Um, <clears throat> so that, that political and American involvement is, it's obviously not the only factor in a very complex picture, but it's very, very important. It, the rest of the world is not just spectators. They, they have a possibility of, of being involved here. And as I said, that, that takes us and I think David can fill us in here on, on um, unless you want me to give a little bit of the history on the story of Atarot, which is another you know it, that's the I, most I, recent I, example. Yes, uh, I will just set you up for that, if you don't mind, because um, I'm going to yeah. take it back to Nevi Samuel, uh, where we were just in a moment ago, where I showed that wide finger. And I want to show the green line again, the Jerusalem municipality. Again, here are the old cities in the distance. We can see the Mount Scopus Hebrew University campus just to get an understanding that we are northwest uh, of the old city and the city center uh, from this vantage point. And from here, we could really clearly see the strategy of what we call the ring neighborhoods to widen effectively a ring around the area of the green line. When I put on the Israeli neighborhoods here, you can really see how those neighborhoods are very clearly designed uh, to create that uh, widened area uh, from around the green line. And I'll just make note that among those areas is Ramat Shlomo, uh, where there had been famously an announcement of building uh, during a visit of, of then Vice President Biden that had led to tensions during that period of the Obama administration. And when we refer to Atarot, we're talking again about this wide, narrow uh, expanse uh, finger to the north that Gershom was mentioning was in part uh, uh, about control of the high mountain ridge and part about controlling that land strip. And we can also note that Route 60, the major highway that serves as the backbone on the mountain ridge of the West Bank, crosses directly through this finger as well. And so that finger served both to um, control the airstrip of Atarot, which is here, so we can see here is the airstrip, as well as to dominate that landscape. Now I have another vantage point, which I wanna show, which is quite remarkable, I think. Uh, and that is this 3D rendering. Let's see if I can drag it into the screen. Okay, and I'm gonna make this a larger screen so you all can see it. I'm sorry, give me one moment. Uh, and here we can really look directly above onto the airstrip and I just want to make note of a few things. Now, in recent weeks, of course, this has been in the news because of the plans to build some 9,000 homes for an ultra-Orthodox community uh, in this area of the now abandoned airport. Uh, and I want to make just two notes. Number one is here on the very far right, you can see the terminal that is, uh, that is the Kalandia uh, checkpoint. Uh, this is the major... Uh, station where Palestinians traveling from the West Bank uh, and from Ramallah go into Jerusalem with work permits and the like are going through this significant checkpoint area. The second thing to note is this area here is the most northernmost neighborhood in within the Jerusalem municipality is the neighborhood of Kafar Akob, which serves within the boundaries of the Jerusalem municipality. But as we can see in front of us is on the wrong side, is on the far side 
of the security barrier. And so the plan here was to build a substantial neighborhood uh, really uh, that was uh, uh, surrounded uh, actually on all sides from major Palestinian population centers. And it led to the most, most uh, uh, challenging phone call yet between the Biden administration uh, and uh, the new Israeli government, uh, which ultimately led uh, this plan, this proposal, uh, with the official note is that it needs to be examined for environmental impact that will stall the plan for at least one year. But Gershom, I know that you have some fascinating context in history that I think would be really helpful to understand the context of this development. Okay, so this finger, the northern finger reaches almost to Ramallah. Um, it controls high ground. It controlled that airport, which Israel tried to continue operating after 67, but um, international uh, carriers were not willing to fly into occupied territory. So it ended up only carrying domestic flights to a lot uh, to Haifa. And then in, when the second intifada began in 2001, it became impossible, unsafe to operate out of there. And basically <clears throat> the airfield has been abandoned for the last 20 years. The idea of putting, of building the proposal now was for 9,000 housing units in, in that empty space was again going to uh, uh, create another division between Palestinian areas um, and uh, create a wedge between Ramallah and, and East Jerusalem. Um, this is the refrain, the idea in these plans is to keep, um, is to separate out East Jerusalem to prevent the idea of East Jerusalem as a capital of a, of a Palestinian state. And the assumption always is that certainly neighborhoods built within Jerusalem will be untouchable in any sort of peace accord. I would suggest that they could have the opposite effect. At the point where the neighborhoods inside the Jerusalem boundary become a sufficient barrier to reaching an agreement, they may also be on the table. So once again, the, the uh, strategy of creating facts is something that can boomerang. And I don't think it prevents a peace agreement, but it raises the price of such an agreement in, in economic terms, in political terms, and in social terms for Israel. Thank you. The one, one thing I'll just note from the Washington perspective, and the, one of the reasons why I think that this plan in particular uh, got the reaction uh, from the Biden administration, and I was smiling earlier, Gosham, when you were telling that story about the Johnson administration, because so many times I've been giving these presentations and I've been saying, you know, Gershom Gorenberg once said that uh, during the, <laughs> I've been relating your own story, and so now I get to hear it firsthand. <laughs> But uh, no, what I think is fascinating is that, you know, the Biden administration has been preoccupied with a lot of other things, clearly. Uh, and yet this got their attention. And the, one of the reasons it got their attention is that even under the Trump plan, the plan that we showed uh, briefly at the outset, even under the Trump administration's proposal, this landing strip was not to be uh, controlled by Israel, but was actually under the plan was supposed to be effectively a uh, tourism center, a hub uh, for Palestinian tourism to connect to, uh, to Jerusalem with uh, buses and so forth to visit the old city and the like. This was set aside for a specific Palestinian tourism zone. Uh, and yet even this proposal for 9,000 units went beyond and violated uh, the proposals of the Trump plan. And I think that in particular uh, was, was going especially far in terms of uh, the administration recognizing that this was, this was a step uh, beyond. Um, as we look, I think we'll have time to, to go just further to the South to look at one other issue. And, and here I'm gonna move us to Kibbutz Ramat Rachel looking to the South. And again, I just wanna orient us to the bottom right of your screen. Uh, you can see that we are looking directly to the south. And from this vantage point, once again, we can see the purple Jerusalem municipal boundary in front of us looking directly to the south. We can now see beyond the Jerusalem municipal boundary, the city of Bethlehem uh, to the south. 
And I think there's- And David, as you're doing that, are you able to also point out the root of the barrier where wall fence is going there? I think so, yes. Here okay. is the, the root of the, the, the barrier is here. The red line that I've just added is Thank the you. Root of the barrier. Um, my gosh, I think you're about 5,000 meters above my house right now. <laughs> it's not in real time, so we will not spy on you, I promise. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> if we're looking back towards the city, uh, I just want to orient ourselves. We can see the green line uh, in front of us. And here we're looking at a particularly interesting uh, uh, situation. Here we're looking at the issue of Givatamatos. And then I want to come back, uh, Gershom, for you to, to say a word about the situation in uh, Walaje as well. Um, uh, from here, I just want to point out uh, the uh, significance of the area of Givatamatos, which has traditionally, similar to E1, be one, has been one of those red lines uh, that has been viewed as uh, uh, hampering Palestinian access uh, to Jerusalem and contiguity uh, from the major population centers of the northern and southern West Bank uh, to East Jerusalem. Now, the reason of, of that is that same road that we mentioned before, Route 60, which effectively goes straight through uh, uh, Jerusalem and onward to the north of that finger. Uh, you can see here that Route 60 prior to 1967 was the major access point from Bethlehem, this area in red, to Jerusalem. But of course, from from uh, 49, I'm sorry, from uh, from 49 to 67. Uh, this, of course, was a border between Israel and Jordan. And so Bethlehem, uh, Palestinians from Bethlehem were unable to take this road into Jerusalem because, of course, this was crossing into Israel. And so what was built to bypass that issue uh, was a new system of roads. And here you can see what we've labeled the Old Jordanian Road, which effectively served that Palestinians would travel this route and then around the area of the Green Line. I'm sorry if this is disorienting, but you can see going around the area of the Green Line and then connecting to the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. Now, one of the main concerns uh, Palestinians have, particularly about the issue of Givat Hamatos, is emblematic of the issue of this neighborhood here directly in front of us, Har Homa, built in the late 1990s. Um, uh, af the only neighborhood built after the signing of the Oslo Accords, new neighborhood built after the signing of the Oslo Accords. And you can see how it disconnects the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem from Bethlehem, but it also serves to dominate what had been that traditional access road from Bethlehem uh, to East Jerusalem. The new plan of Givat Hamatos is effectively on the other side uh, of that road, as we can see here. Um, and the concern, of course, is that there will ultimately be an effort to continue that strategy of the ring neighborhoods that would effectively bisect Bethlehem from East Jerusalem. Now, one could even go beyond this in this area here, and I want to pull the three-dimensional uh, imagery for a moment, because just beyond, uh, I should say, the other issue of Givat Hamatos is the manner in which it has cut uh, Beit Safafa also from the areas of East Jerusalem. Uh, and just on the other side of Beit Safafa, we now have a new issue in the village of Walaje, which um, Gershom, I'm gonna ask you to say a word as I try to pull up some 3D imagery of the Walaje okay. site. Yeah, thank you. So um, just a small thing about the American politics, the bids, the call for bids on building in Givata Matos went out after the U.S. election and the bids were supposed to come in before the inauguration. And that was when Netanyahu was still in power. In other words, it was a clear attempt to exploit the last days of the Trump uh, administration and the interregnum in order to get this in. It was, it was a very nasty inauguration present for, for, uh, for Joe Biden. Um, Walija is a tiny village, a uh, couple thousand people, uh, it's on the southwest corner of Jerusalem. If you've right. been in Jerusalem, it's very close to the Jerusalem Zoo, to the Malchamal. 
And when that line was hastily drawn in 1967, nobody noticed that it cut right through the middle of this, of this little farming village. So half of Wallachia ended up inside the Jerusalem city limits. Literally, no one noticed the, the villagers or the government for a number of years. And when it was discovered that Wallachia was inside the city limits, a battle uh, of planning and building enforcement began because no uh, master plan, no zoning plan for Wallachia was ever adopted. Without a zoning plan, you can't build legally. Population grew, people built houses anyway. And today, dozens of houses in Wallachia uh, face demolition orders unless a, um, unless a zoning plan uh, can be enacted. This sounds like technical, you know, local politics, but in Jerusalem, all local politics are international. Um, so there's essentially an effort through the use of this local planning mechanism to squeeze out Wallachia, to push the people who are in the Jerusalem side of Wallachia out to the, to the West Bank side of Wallachia. I, I won't go into more details here, but I have a piece that, that's on the Washington Post site that went up yesterday that you can look at that will give you a little bit more uh, uh, detail about that. My suggestion strongly was, uh, Mr. Blinken, you need to pick up the phone again to Mr. Bennett and tell him don't demolish houses in in uh, in Wallachia. Um, yes, and, I'm, I'm and, sorry. and that's like one more flashpoint that's developed in this ring around Jerusalem. I, I'd like to, to say one more thing here. What, what we're talking about, it sounds, depressing. There's obviously people with power who want to cut off or extremely limited two-state agreement. And there are other people who you will hear saying that means a two-state agreement is out of reach. And I want to say that is an incorrect conclusion because when you're considering policies, you have to compare them to the alternatives, whether those alternatives are achievable and whether they're better. And to borrow a, a line from the movie Argo, the two-state outcome is still the best bad plan that we have. It is far superior to any other proposal for reaching a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. The question that we're discussing here is the politics of how to avoid raising the price of that plan and how to eventually get to it. And the reason for opposing these developments is not, in my view, that it takes a two-state agreement off the table, but that it uh, it makes it more painful to achieve, take, makes it longer to achieve, and increases the, the price for the state of Israel when inevitably it is achieved. Thank you, Gershom. I think that was really well put. And I think for the last 10 minutes, uh, Josh, we'd love to take questions. I'm going to mm -hmm. stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to reshare it again if we have questions that require uh, visuals to, to, to show. Uh, yeah, Gershon, first of all, thank you for that last point. And I think that is um, a point that is uh, in high contention right now as some people are you know, commenting on the death of the two-state solution or to say that there's nothing there. Would you comment specifically, there's also a question that came in to me um, about a proposal that some are calling the confederation solution uh, and to, you know, some people say that, oh, that, that's really the default, that's what's going to happen, and so we ought to, uh, you know, examine that more closely, um, and, and what are your thoughts about that, and then, and then I'll move on to the next question, if, if possible. Well, first of all, I would say that when you talk about a confederation, you're talking about a variation on the two-state agreement. A confederation, a confederated uh, political entity as distinct from a federal one, Federal one is, you know, the United States, the central government ultimately has sovereignty. In a confederated situation, you is, is more like the European Union. You have independent sovereign states who have agreed to give up a, a certain amount of uh, sovereignty to, to uh, coordinated or central control for, for mutual gains. Um, so proposing this as as if it's a completely different animal than the two-state agreement, I think is, is, is a mistake. What the proposal is, is that two states will come into existence and they will agree to, in their yeah. moment of that, that agreement, to certain concessions to ease their coexistence, which by the way, is what the original uh, 1947 UN partition plan called for. Uh, there are certain aspects of that 
that are attractive, particularly in terms of free movement between states. Uh, I, I, my feeling is it's a little bit presumptuous for Israelis to propose that because what it means is we're turning to the Palestinians and we're saying in your moment of creating a state, please give up some aspects of your sovereignty. Uh, I, I'm not the person sitting at the negotiating table, but that doesn't seem to me to be uh, the best negotiating position. Yeah, and also there may be some additional security issues that need to be uh, to worked out there before uh, moving forward with that. But, but, but speaking of Israelis, and I want to get to the next question uh, from uh, Nathan Brown, is that, you know, um, we are getting very much into the weeds uh, and to some of the you know, very specific details. And uh, I think we all can agree that the virtual tour software is an excellent, excellent tool for us to be able to do that. Um, but the question is about, uh, would, would Israelis, you know, Grisham, from your opinion of being there on the ground, would Israelis, you know, and I guess that's too sort of general to, uh, to describe, but come to a session like this, where we are looking at the intricacies of, you know, where the green line is, where the barriers, where the municipal boundaries are, and really trying to understand the intricacies of uh, this highly contentious discussion about settlements, about Jerusalem, about all of this. Um, and if so, what, what does that say about us as you know, mainly North American Jews looking at uh, this in great, great detail, um, even more than sometimes we can see when we're actually on the ground uh, and versus Israelis who you know, maybe share a little bit about what, what the discussion is in Israel uh, about these things. Well, I'm going to say a couple of things. One is um, when you're looking at that green line, you're seeing more than Israelis see on the map. Actually, if you look at the Google map of, of, of Israel or a Waze map, you'll see uh, a very thin dotted line that indicates the green line, almost unnoticeable. Um, and so one of the things that's happened is that the green line has sort of faded from, from consciousness. and um, and part of the effort of anybody who's working on ideas of a two-state outcome it has to do is, is to bring that back into consciousness. But I would say that the freeze, the, the sense of, of, of no exit, so we'll stay where we are from an Israeli point of view is a result of two developments, of the second intifada and of uh, the withdrawal from Gaza being followed by the Hamas takeover. So now more than it, more than ever, a crucial consideration for pushing forward any ideas uh, to move forward to a two-state agreement is the consideration of how you talk about security, how you talk about people's safety afterwards, how you talk about the stability of a, of a Palestinian state. And um, again, those are issues that in large part also involve uh, international involvement, not retreating from the Middle East, but dealing with the, with the Middle East. Um, and I'm going to give an example here of how public consciousness can change. I went back and looked at surveys from the 70s of how Israelis felt uh, in six, 76 and 77 about Anwar Sadat saying he wanted peace with Israel. Before Sadat came to Jerusalem and, and made a hard offer for peace, when Israelis were asked, is Sadat sincere? The answer was 85% said, no, he's not sincere about peace, which after the Yom Kippur War, which was even more traumatic than the Second Intifada, was not surprising. After Sadat's visit, the first poll showed that 85% of Israelis thought that Sadat was sincere. A 70% shift in opinion. What I think that you can learn from this is when you're talking about something in the abstract, giving something up, but you have no sense of getting a secure and peaceful agreement out of it, there's going to be a strong tendency to oppose it. When there's a practical proposal on, on the table that gives you a sense that I'll get something out of this, that I'll get a peaceful future out of this, that things will be different for me and for my children and my grandchildren, public opinion can shift very, very strongly. And that's what we have to look for is how to create that, that sensibility. 
Yeah, and that, that is exactly the next question that came in uh, in the Q&A section, uh, also about you know, how would one be able to achieve or how would we be able to achieve a smooth transition if, if we were forced to you know, evacuate settlers, do like we did in the disengagement uh, in 2005 or consolidate certain areas, um, you know, would there be something that the, settler, the settlers that were amorphous um, to accept one of these solutions. Uh, and another question came in about if there was a Palestinian state, you know, would Jews be allowed to, if they wanted to remain in certain settlements right now, be able to live freely uh, in, in the Palestinian state? And I'll just say we have about three minutes left, um, and I wanna make sure we each have time for final, uh, final remarks. Okay, um, on one level I would say to you, let's say, all 400,000 settlers who were living outside of Jerusalem had to move back to Israel. You would be talking about 40% the size of the Soviet Aliyah during the, um, during the 1990s, 90s. with the difference that there are people who are Hebrew speaking and mostly have jobs in Israel. So if you ask, can Israel absorb that? Yes. The question is the way that is presented, uh, the way that it is politically sold and specifically to the settlers themselves. My own thought, I wrote this in a, in a, a book that uh, Dan Kurtzer edited that came out in 2012 called Pathways to Peace, that one of the best ways to make that transition would be in fact negotiating for the right of Jews to stay in the Palestinian state, but as residents fully subject to um, the laws, courts, et cetera, of the Palestinian state. My estimation is that the number of settlers who would want that arrangement is probably somewhere around the number of people who are present for this Zoominar. Um, but you would be- Massive, wide support. With, saying, yeah. Right, you would be presenting them with a choice that would ease the pressure on the Israeli government for these crazy kinds of compensation. And uh, it would get away from this idea that you're forcing Jews out. But the reality is people living in those settlements wanna live in a Jewish state. And I think that given that choice, and given the possibility of easing their transition to moving back into Israel, you could make that um, politically possible. Uh, it happened when France gave up Algeria. It happened when Portugal gave up its colonies. I think we can give up what's essentially the colony of the West Bank and successfully steer toward a, toward a future. Great. Th thank you so much, Gershon. And before we um, trans, I know it's just about time, but David, I want to pose to you the last question, if possible, and about the um, what you think the U.S. administration should do, and should it strive toward establishing informal understanding with Israel regarding the settlements, like Bush did, and, and I guess Trump did sometimes, or should it continue to have theoretical blanket opposition and only engage and oppose anecdotally when it when it sees fit. Um, in terms, of, you know, what what should U.S. policy be essentially towards this? And then we'll uh, we'll just summarize at, at the end. So, look, I, I think the importance is maintaining the 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 goal of main of a political horizon that's consistent with the, the idea of a two state solution. Ultimately, this has to be agreed. Uh, I think that the one of the important points, as we saw in this presentation today is that we can think about the areas of, of major settlement blocks that have been consistently part of uh, land swap negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, particularly in the area of the Greater Jerusalem Triangle, when you think of areas like Modein Elite, Beitar Elite, and Ma'ale Adumim even, uh, in the context of negotiations. The question is less about building within blocks. In, it, it's a question of building, extending the footprint of those existing blocks. As we see, it's one thing to say uh, that it's okay to build in the blocks, and then your definition of the Male Adumim block includes the area of E1. Well, then that is problematic. And so I think when we talk about building beyond the blocks or building within the blocks, we have to be very, very precise about what we mean. And I mean, not just we, uh, the American government, but we advocates uh, as well about how we are thinking about these issues uh, as well. It's very obvious and clear that building at the heart of the West Bank in areas surrounding major population centers along the mountain ridge in illegal outposts or authorized construction in areas that are far, far from the green line present 
uh, just greater obstacles uh, and greater costs on the way to two states. And it is clear that those settlements that are closer uh, to the green line are far more consistent with an eventual Israeli-Palestinian negotiation. But we have to be precise because the Male uh, uh situation even shows us that it is not so much the block itself, but it's exactly how you define the block and its extended area. And so I think that uh, as much, uh, I, I want to go back to the issue that uh, Gershom mentioned and that I was uh, kind of smiling about is a recognition that the Biden administration today has a few things on its plate, <laughs> to put it, put, put it mildly. <laughs> the, the attention uh, being a, a finite, you know, limited resource. Yeah. Right. But it needs to make its red lines very, very clear. It needs to make it very clear of what is going too far, especially when addressing uh, an Israeli government that has all sorts of forces competing against one another to see just how far they can move their own agendas. Uh, and I think that um, the Biden administration needs to be crystal clear and not assume uh, that nothing is possible because of the nature of the Israeli government. Uh, I think the danger, of course, uh, is the story uh, of, of a Johnson administration that had other things to do and just couldn't focus. Uh, it's important that the United States is clear about what its priorities are. Uh, even if we're not engaging in a robust peace process, it needs to be clear about what is it's not prepared uh, uh, to accept. Uh, and, and to be clear about that with the Israeli counterparts. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I think that's a good, good message uh, of calling for clarity that we can end on. I wanna deeply, deeply thank uh, Gershom Gorenberg and David Halpern for this excellent high-level presentation. Of course, there is much more that could be discussed here and we could do another several hours just talking about all of the issues and questions. Uh, and I hope that this is the beginning, of course, and not the end. Um, we do have another webinar coming up on January 12th, talking about people to people, talking about civil society in both Israeli and Palestinian societies. Um, this recording will be available uh, on the website and you can go and relook it. I want to, you know, and watch it again and really uh, capture some of the important messages. Um, I want to encourage everyone to read at first The Accidental Empire and uh, all of Gershon's articles, I think specifically most recently in the Washington Post, as you mentioned. I want people to go into the Israel policy uh, site that Sierra posted in the chat and look at this virtual tour software. Um, and also as on behalf of the URJ and our uh, work within the realm of the national institutions, the issue of funding settlements, especially through Kakal uh, is coming up uh, and is um, a battle that we are engaged in very closely. Um, and I hope that you all support our efforts there. Uh, support for IPF for URJ is always, always critical. And as you're thinking about that end of 2021 gift, uh, I want to let you know that um, in order to further this work, we deeply, deeply appreciate your support and hope that we can count on you to be our partner in the future. Again, my deep thanks uh, to both of you, to Sierra de Crosta and Molly Blumenthal. I hope to see you on the 12th and to uh, continue this important discussion. Thanks so much.